Okay, so we'll be discussing concepts of biology, uh, chapter four, how, s how cells obtain energy. Okay, so all living system requires uh, energy, and the nutrients must be metabolized, synthesized, modified, transported around the cell, and be distributed through the entire organism. All this requires energy, but where does that come from? Well, it comes from the sun, ultimately. The term bioenergetics uh, refers to the concept of biology or a concept of energy flowing through various systems that's shown here. So here's a producer, and here's a, a consumer, and here are the decomposers. And all the same energy moved through all these different organisms. And these uh, uh, energy flows in stepwise chemical reactions that release energy or require energy. And the chemical reaction that takes place inside the cell are referred to as the cell's metabolism. And when it comes to sugar metabolism, living things consume sugar because they have a lot of energy stored in the bonds. The plants also consume, uh, well, plants that produce the sugar consume CO2 and H2O to make the sugar and, uh, and oxygen using sun's energy. That's ultimately what drives this reaction. And that reaction is referred to as the photosynthesis. It requires six carbon molecules and six water molecule to produce one single glucose molecule and six oxygen molecules. And they're called the autotrophs because they make the sugar they need for their own energy. And we are the heterotrophs because we consume the sugar that they make. And animals consume sugar and release O2, or sugar and O2 to release CO2 and H2O. And here's producers producing the sugars, consumers, and both producers and consumers are decomposed by decomposers, and they in turn release heat. So what is metabolism? Metabolism occurs in uh, many different metabolic, very complicated uh, metabolic pathways. In particular, sugar metabolism. Sugar is made from smaller molecules, CO2 and water, and then sugar is broken down into, again, uh, smaller molecules. Uh, anabolic pathways, building up of polymers, anabolic pathways, from monomers. Here's a polymer being formed by the monomers using energy. Catabolic pathways, breaking down of the polymers to monomers, takes large molecule and breaks down into monomers to produce energy. And the metabolism is composed of synthesis, anabolism, and degradation, catabolism. And these two opposite processes are needed to maintain the energy balance in the cell. So what is energy? Energy is defined as the ability to do work. And the thermodynamics refers to the study of energy and energy transfer involving physical matter. So it deals with system and surroundings. System is just any matter that is relevant to a particular case of energy transfer. And the surrounding, of course, is the everything outside of it. And then, then the system with energy transfer must have a boundary to itself. And there are two types of systems, open systems and closed systems. Open, in open systems, energy is lost to the surroundings freely. It allows free movement of energy between the surrounding and the system. For example, stovetop, you turn the stovetop on, energy is released into the surroundings. Living systems, we are also open systems. Uh, closed system, energy is not lost. Uh, imagine a stovetop being locked in a thermally insulated uh, safe. That's somewhat of an uh, example of what closed systems look like. And the laws of thermodynamics govern the transfer of energy among all systems in the universe. And the first law of thermodynamics states that energy may be transferred or transformed, but it cannot be created or destroyed. For instance, gas burner changes gas or chemical into fire or heat energy. Ice cream consumed by kids give kinetic energy to kids. Sun lighting up the leaf allows photosynthesis. So all these are energy transfer examples. And in every energy transfer, heat it, energy is lost. Where heat is referred to as the energy transfer from one system to another that is not work. 
And the second law of thermodynamics states that energy will always be lost as heat in energy transfer or transformation. And uh, as more energy is lost to the surroundings, more le or less order or more random the system becomes. And that randomness underlies the idea of, of, of entropy. And entropy is the measure of randomness or disorder within the system. In a universe, entropy increases overall. It gets more random. But the living things are highly ordered. And that's why it requires constant energy input to be maintained in the state of low entropy. And the effect of losing some energy during transfer, think about working out using energy. Do you heat up? Your body heats up. Then your body produces sweat. And sweat evaporates the but your skin evaporates the sweat and your body cools down. So that's an example of losing energy as a living system. So there are two types of energy, potential and kinetic energy. Potential energy is energy that is stored in object location or state. Think of a wrecking ball that is raised two, story, yes, two stories high, or a bow that's fully drawn, or a rubber band that's uh, stretched out. That is a potential energy being demonstrated. And the kinetic energy is associated with object in motion. Moving, think about wrecking ball being released and about to hit a, a demolition building. Or think about an arrow being released. That's all energy associated with motion. Um, so the free energy is defined as that is usable energy. It's the energy that is available to do work. And the change in this free energy if this is referred to as the delta G and shows the energies of reactants and products. If it's positive delta G, reaction is called the endergonic. If it's negative uh, delta G, energy is referred to as exergonic. And here's an endergonic reaction where the reactants have less energy than the potential than the products because the energy had to be inputted into the system, into the products. Whereas in a ex exergonic, the reactants have more energy than the products, and that lose that leads to loss of energy by the reactants. So let's think about so energy either exits or enters. If you look at it, this compost, heat is being released, so it must be exergonic. Here's a little cute chick, uh, chick being hatched from its own eggs. It's endergonic because it requires input of energy. Tea steeping, if you think about a hot tea, you use hot water's energy to steep uh, tea molecules out of the tea leaves. And here's a ball rolling down hill. Is it exergonic? It's exergonic because this potential energy up here is being released by rolling down the hill. <coughs> so exergonic energy is exiting the system, negative delta G. Also, this is referred to as the spontaneous reaction. Not immediate or not fast, but spontaneous. Iron rusting is a spontaneous process, but it's very slow. And the exergonic reaction requires small input of energy to get going. And that's what is shown here. This activation energy is required to get the reaction going. And the endergonic reaction cannot occur without this addition of free energy. This is called activation energy. Without this, endergonic reactions cannot occur. And activation energy is just referred to as the small amount of energy input that's necessary for all chemical reactions to occur. Enzymes function as catalysts in biological system, and what it does is lowers that activation energy. And the catalyst uh, helps a chemical reaction to occur by lowering the activation energy. Most enzymes are proteins. Uh, enzyme is, remains unchanged by the reaction and can be reused. And enzymes, again, lower the activation energy, but do not change the overall free energy of the reaction. 
delta G free energy, difference between reactant and the products, that is the delta G. Note the activation energy decreased, but the overall free energy change did not uh, change. So how, does, how do these enzymes work? The enzymes bind uh, chemical reactants called substrates. And you can have one or more substrates possible depending on chemical reactions. The substrate binds the enzyme's active sites. So when enzyme binds its substrate in uh, this induced fit model, enzyme substrate complex is formed, but its conformation is changed. And that leads to increase in affinity for the substrate, of the, uh, for the enzyme. And then once the products are formed, it returns to its own uh, its initial uh, conformation. And as cellular demands vary, so do the amounts and the functionality of different, different enzymes. Uh, the amounts and the functions of enzymes determine the reaction and the rates. And this requires regulation of enzymes. And also uh, partly is controlled by factors like pH, temperature, salt, cofactors, and coenzymes. Cofactors are typically metal ions, manganese, iron, cobalt, zinc. This is why we take mineral supplements. And coenzymes typically are vital, uh, vital amines or vitamins. They're vital because body does not make them. And they're amine, they're nitrogen compounds. So enzyme regulation can promote or inhibit its activity. You can, and for an inhibitor, inhibition, you can have a competitive inhibition or non-competitive inhibition. In a competitive inhibition, an inhibitor molecule binds the active site. And because it's bound, it blocks the actual substrate from binding. Note, it, competitive binding, competitive inhibitor, inhibition does not change the maximum rate of the enzyme. Whereas non-competitive inhibition, like inhibitor molecule binding to an al allosteric site, does change the maximum rate. It's an example of uh, non-competitive inhibition. Why is that? How is that? Because rate is a function of a conformation, shape of the enzyme itself. So the allosteric inhibitor changed the conformation uh, of the enzyme and lowers the affinity for the substrate itself. Here's an allosteric inhibition. It's binding to uh, its regulation site, and it changes the, uh, the shape of the active site. And, but you can also have allosteric activators that does the similar thing, except its conformation changes, raises the affinity for the enzyme. And uh, typically, allosteric inhibitors, inhibitors, again, are cofactors or coenzymes. And uh, these are allosteric factors that bind to the enzyme to help function optimally. Okay, so have you ever wondered how pharmaceutical drugs are developed? Enzymes are typically key components of uh, metabolic pathways. And understanding how enzymes work and how they can be regulated is a key principle behind developing uh, pharmaceutical drugs. <clears throat> First, the, the target is identified and the various chemicals are typically screened for effects on the uh, enzymes. What are some examples? Statins. Statins block HMG-CoA reductase, synthesizes, which uh, synthesizes cholesterol from lipids and in the body. So it reduces uh, cholesterol levels. Vitamin C, this is a coenzyme for multiple en uh, enzymes that makes connective tissues like collagen. SSRI, serotonin reuptake inhibitor, serotonin receptor, uh, that's also uh, uh, an enzyme. Uh, Tylenol is a COX-1 and 2 inhibitor. All of these uh, drugs typically bind or interact with metabolism. So how, how are the metabolic pathways regulated? Typically, it uh, uses what we call feedback inhibition. And feedback inhibition involves use of reactions products, end products, or mid products, to regulate its own further production. So in other words, the end product, seen here, feeds back to regulate 
or inhibit the beginning of its own synthesis. So that's why it's called the feeds back. So <clears throat> allosteric, it can be allosteric, but doesn't have to be. You can also have negative feedback uh, or feedback regulate the production of the enzyme, not just the activity. For example of that is lac operon. We'll go over that uh, in a few chapters. So <clears throat> more example of feedbacks, production of um, uh, amino acids, nucleotides, ATP, these are all controlled through feedbacks. ATP, ATP functions as a negative allosteric inhibitor of its own synthesis. ADP functions as a positive allosteric inhibitor. So if ATP goes up, you stop making ATP. If ADP goes up, then you start making more ADP. So high ATP needs of uh, concentration negates the need for making more ATP. But high ADP means cells have been using a lot of ATP, so it needs to make more ATP. So what is this ATP uh, thing? ATP is produced in glycolysis in different places. It's called the adenosine triphosphate. That's why it's tri-3. ATP, suppl ATP supplies energy for all reactions in the cell. And the cells cannot store free energy. It will heat up and cook the protein. So it needs a way to uh, store energy and harness it uh, safely. And that's where this ATP comes in. Adenosine monophosphate is made up of an adenine molecule, adenine by a base, that is bound to a ribose molecule and has a phosphate group. And of course, the ATP has alpha, beta, and gamma phosphate groups. And it's the gamma phosphate that is most uh, energetic. So AMP, ADP, ATP differ by attached number of phosphates. Note the negative charges on the phosphates here. All these negative charges, they repel each other. And it makes the entire chain highly unstable. And that makes the third phosphate group, the gamma phosphate group, the most energetic. So how does cell make these things? So in glycolysis, the first step is to break down the glucose into uh, to convert to ATP. Here's a glucose molecule. Fruto fructose diphosphate is produced from that by spending two ATP to produce glyceraldehyde three phosphates, three GP. So two ATP is spent to convert one ringed glucose into two three carbon glyceraldehyde molecule. Note the intermediate uh, fructose uh, diphosphate or disphosphate. Where do you often find fructose? You find in fruit sugar, but also in high fructose corn syrup. You don't spend two ATP to process fructose. Is that good or bad? Something to think about. So the breakdown, breakdown of glucose in order to produce ATP continues two molecules of 3GP is converted then into two molecules of pyruvate and two ATP and one NADH is produced. So two ATP and that's per one single pyruvate. So you end up actually making four ATP and two NADH. Note the red blood cells only use glycolysis as their sole ATP source. This is this with the production of two ATPs and one NADH per pyruvate. The glycolysis has terminated, but this is not the stop of further breakdown of the glucose. <clears throat>